Eichmann, as usual, this is one of my favorite spots right here, where I get an opportunity to thank our guests because I know they're coming with a couple of things that are very expensive time. Time is one of the most expensive commodity that is being misused by many of us today. And so I want to thank Isabel for coming and spending some of this quality stuff. The other, her journey. The journey housed who she was and made her this beautiful, enlightened spirit sitting before us. And so we were excited that she's coming here to share some of her wisdom so that we can all grow and become better human spirits while we are here on this planet called Earth. Isabel, thank you for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you for having me. It's it's already fun. We've been talking for 10 minutes and it's already fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Tell them about the things that you do today, all the things that I tell people. Um, uh, hurry up to become a servant because it's a great lifestyle. Talk to us about that space or where you are and what you do today. Well, I'm a mindset facilitator. So what I do is I help people from all walks of life and through workshops and public speaking and my upcoming book. Um, I help people to just liberate their limiting beliefs so they can show up as who they are really the real them and it's a journey self-discovery is a journey and it takes time and it takes willingness and it takes patience and understanding and kindness to ourselves and mm -hmm. it's important to um to be accompanied in that process because the mind that create the illusions that in which we live in can't see that it's illusions. So we can't get out. The mind that created the space can't see the space that it created. So we need the outside help, the outside coach. I don't like that word, but I'll use it. Um, the outside coach or support. I like support better. Just to, yeah. you know, sometimes show a mirror and just reflect and help the person see what their behavior is telling, what their work and is what they're doing aligned with who they are. Are they just, yeah. are they, did they just simply follow the recipe? Because we <laughs> are taught a recipe from our families, our communities, and, and it doesn't matter where you live in the world because yeah. every community has its recipe. So I live in North America. In North America, you go to school, you graduate, you find a job, you find a husband, you get married, you have 1.7 kids, and then you're happy. Well, not necessarily, because if that's incongruent with who you are and what you want, then that's the Walt Disney version of happiness, and it's, yeah. it might not be yours. So that's what I do. And my awesome. upcoming book, thank you. And my upcoming book is called Mind Your Own Happiness. Because I believe nice. that when we start by minding our own business, <laughs> and if something isn't related to you and doesn't has nothing to do with you and if you leave it alone and you let it let the person the other person do what they need to do in their lives and in their growth and in their journey and you don't take it personally if you don't take other people other people's lives personally then you're happier yeah and you can I agree be in you stand in your own truth and then you can serve others yeah, I absolutely, one hundred percent agree. And you forgot the white Thank picket you. fence, by the way. You know, so well, yes, um, that's true. But I hate fences. <laughs> <laughs> I can. I live in Canada. We have a lot of space, so we don't put fences because our lots are so big, right? <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. I love Canada as well. Um, how okay. we do it? Our our custom is to go back into our childhood because I believe that's where 
you and I are formed at least for a major part of our lives. And then one day we have to deal with that formation that we had created as a young child as we began mm -hmm. to grow and walk into adulthood. So talk to us, introduce us to your, I call it the, for, the first lab by which we get a chance to reside. And the scientists, which is mom and dad, are now going to um, begin to input their thesis into us and all of their information that they've gained and their, from their trauma. And then they're going to now bring us up and uh, so that we can be ready for the world, as they say. So introduce us to your family as to how was that? Well, I am the uh, youngest of three. I'm the baby. I hated that term when I was a child, but I'm okay with it. Um, my older sibling is my sister and my sister and my brother, my brother are 18 months apart, and I am four years after that. So I really was the baby. I was yeah. al always um, shorter and <laughs> weaker. I don't like that word, but weaker as in strength, physical strength. Yeah. Um, so I was uh, born and raised here in uh, the French part of Canada in a uh, small, uh, small town. Everybody, uh, it's, it was a very quiet, very, very quiet place, very peaceful place to live with lots of trees. And we had an apple tree in our backyard and that was, I loved climbing that tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was easy for us, for me, to connect to nature because we lived in nature. And that was yeah. important and it's still important to me now. And uh, my first big slap, my big life lesson came early. I was five years old when my mother passed away. She was 36. Uh, uh, my, my mom died of lung cancer. And between her diagnose and her death was only nine months. Wow. And so... That was um, that was a a big uh, a big slap. Uh, Dad remarried really quickly. This is the 1970s. Um, when my mom passed away, my dad didn't know how to boil an egg because men had not been allowed in the kitchen. Yeah. So we had a lot of help. Um, the neighbors, uh, the both set of grandparents. Uh, every day we would go have lunch at somebody else's house so we would have a really big home-cooked meal because this was the time where everybody went home for lunch, right? So that gave me a sense of community. It gave me a sense of regardless of what happens, I didn't know it at the time, but regardless of what happened in your life, you need a, your village. You need your tribe. That's how I call it now. I have yeah. my tribe. And unconditional support. And it doesn't matter when you help somebody that I really truly believe that when you help somebody, I put it in the universe calculator. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is I don't expect that person to help me back. Yeah. But I know that in the big calculator of the universe, when I need help, somebody's going to come and help me. So for me, that freed the expectation that if I help somebody or if I give a gift to somebody, then that person owes me something. Because that's not yeah. a gift. That's an exchange. Yeah. A gift or when you're in service, you give and that's it. But in the grand scheme of things, it will come back to you tenfold. We know that. It will come, come yeah. back to you. So that's, that was the first thing about service is these neighbor, um, these neighbors that cook the meals for us and help us, um, teach us how to do the laundry and clean the house and all that good stuff. We, we never repaid them. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because somebody did. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. So 
after my mom passed away, obviously I was a very sad child and I became a very angry uh, teenager because anger is much easier to deal with than sadness. Because in sadness, there's despair. In anger, there's control. Yeah. And the angry teenager became a bitter adult because at that point, it was just a way to live and a way to survive mm -hmm. and a way to make sense of the world. And lots and lots and lots of work went into destructing that. Yeah. And I'm choose sure. another way to live. And choose a better way to live. Yeah. Now, here's this young... Um, well, let's jump to a teenage girl that has take, taken her uh, sadness and uh, bring it into anger. And I believe that these are ways that we cope. We, we will always take our pain and morph it to um, adapt so that we can function within that pain and from that pain. And so it will always continue to change and metamorphose, if you will, because we need it to, because that's how we cope. So here is this young girl full of anger now. How was she able to communicate to others? How did she communicate to others outside of the family or even inside the family? Um, uh, was she always in a state of anger? What was she like? What was she dealing with as she began to grow to get into this uh, womanhood? Um, no, in my family, um, and it's still a little bit like that, but my father is not a very <laughs> communicative person. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, my, my dog is barking. Um, <laughs> it's funny, he's barking in his sleep. Um, yeah, my father wasn't, and he's he's improved over the, the, the decades, but he's not a very great communicator. So mm -hmm. it was Omerta, right? It was, uh, yeah. you know, we don't talk about these things. We don't, we weren't allowed to express our feelings. And if we yeah. had emotions, and that played into the fact that I, 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 developed anger instead of sadness because when you were sad and you were crying well the only reason a child would cry is because they were tired so you were sent to your room to sleep yeah so that took a long time and sometimes i even catch myself now if i'm having a sad moment and i'm crying i tend to even say out loud i must be tired but no, mm. being tired and being sad are two different things. And one yeah. does not have to be with that, doesn't have to go with the other. So I was angry. I was an angry teenager because I wasn't allowed to express myself. And when I did, I was punished for it. Not in the, my, my father is not an abusive person, not by any stretch of the imagination. He's a very kind man. He was doing his best with what he was facing and what he yeah. his own sadness and his own loss and he just didn't know better i don't yeah, want to yeah. portrait my dad as being um as as being wrong he did the best he could with who he was at the time so um so i didn't i didn't express my anger i really didn't yeah and i was a very uh, obedient child i was afraid of getting in trouble and i was afraid of using drugs and i was afraid of speaking up so i just didn't and they piled on wow until and i when became you... an adult <laughs> we'll get to you to the adult um walk with us as this girl is this young woman is growing up and she's heading into college um or the next phase of her progression into life um what was she thinking about when she looked into the future as far as life um per se college or not college what was she thinking about and which direction did she ch choose um right of a high, right out of high school i uh joined the canadian air force because that was the military that the military was the family business my 
parents had both served and had met in Germany. And when I when I joined the, the Air Force, my brother was an Air Force pilot at the time. So I didn't even think about it. I just, mm -hmm. out of high school, it was the next logical step. And honestly, at that point, I just wanted out. I wanted out of the suburbs. I wanted out of the small town, out of my community, out of my, out of my family, out of everything. And I knew that by joining the military, it was an easy way out because yeah. I didn't have to live with my dad anymore and his wife. I didn't have to stay in that small town. Well, small. There was about 25K at the time, but still I didn't have to live there anymore. And I could just travel the country and travel the world and be of service too. And yeah. being in the military was wonderful because it it did give me a sense of service and it gave me a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. But I realized a few a few years in that I really didn't like the job and I didn't like being like I I I liked all the sidebars that were important to me, yeah. like I just mentioned, purpose, service, and a sense of belonging. And I had found a tribe that accepted me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like what it stood for. I didn't like the actual job. And it wasn't until much, much, much later on in life that I realized that I joined the military because I wanted to finish my mom's life. I wanted mm. to live her life because she wasn't there anymore to live it. So, but that I'm talking decades later that I realized that, but at the time yeah. it was just the next logical step, right? Was to, yeah. to, to join. So I did that for so a when, little less than a decade. Yeah. I'm curious about this switch because um, I'm reading it and I'm like, that's a different uh, direction to go to. Um, <laughs> so uh, talk to us a little. Um, while you were in this, um, uh, you know, program, <coughs> if you will, being, uh, you know, the military, as you say, a pilot and all that stuff, while you're there, you, you like a few things, but not most of it. What was happening to you? What was the conversation? that you were having with yourself when it was quiet and just you and um, your surroundings? I was, I was very discouraged because when I was a kid, all like a lot of children, all I wanted to do was to grow up. Mm -hmm. But for me, growing up meant that I was going to know who I was. I thought for sure. I thought that at least as soon as you got your right to vote, you knew who you were. <laughs> and society showed me that as well. Because yeah. when you're in grade 10, you're expected to choose your college and choose the career you're going to do for the following 40 years. Yeah. So society, I don't know if it's still that way because I don't have kids, but society was teaching me that I was supposed to know who I am and I had no clue. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the reasons why I joined the military because it was also much easier to try to live my mom's life mm -hmm. than to try to figure out my own. Because yeah. with her life, I had something to base to base my decisions on. I knew yeah. she had been in the Air Force. I knew she had gone to Germany. I knew she had married a, ma a nice man. I knew she had had three kids. So I thought that was my recipe. So mm -hmm. I just engaged on that route in order to, to follow that recipe. But I didn't like it. I, I, so when I was alone with my thoughts, I thought I was the only 20-year-old who didn't know from a hole in the wall who she was. And that was very discouraging to me. Yeah. So that, again, took a long time before I realized that 
I'm 51 now and I, I have a better idea of who I am, but you know what? Mm -hmm. it, it might change. And thank God <laughs> for that. Isn't it? I love the fact that I am, um, I don't know what I'm going to be in a couple of days, but I love the fact that it's going to be something special. And so um, I don't see myself going back. And so I don't want to go back in any way, shape or form, uh, because I know how, uh, for lack of a better word, I was slave to nothing, <laughs> to the recipe, wow. if you will. That's very powerful. Yeah, I was a slave to the recipe. And um, yeah. uh, and when we realize that uh, you don't need to be, that's a great day. So here we are, this young woman now. She has her stripes, her little military stuff. She's uh, walking around and not sure about herself. Don't know where do I belong. What was the incident that, came into your life, uh, Isabel, that tapped you on the shoulders and says, okay, let's have a conversation, if you will, that made you started to think, what am I, what, what am I supposed to be doing really? What was that incident and how did it come about? It was uh, the most mundane thing ever and it, they usually are. A mm -hmm. friend of mine wanted to, I had, um, I had been in the military for about eight years at the time. And a friend of mine wanted to do a weekend, um, uh, course on, it was introduction to Swedish massage. Mm -hmm. And because she was contemplating becoming a massage therapist. Yeah. And she didn't want to go alone. Which is really <laughs> ironic because the reason she didn't want to go alone is because she didn't want to touch strangers' body and she wanted to become a massage therapist, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> so, um, so just to go with her, I went to that class and the teacher, her name was France, and she changed my life. She doesn't know and she doesn't need to know, but she changed my life because she was so interesting. She was passionate and she was fun and she, she and I wanted more of that I was yeah. looking at her doing her job because that was her job and yeah. I was looking at her doing her job thinking what you can <laughs> do your job and be happy doing your job I mean yeah. a job is not something something you have to suffer through what what <laughs> so at the end of the weekend, it was 15 hours. And at the end of the 15 hours, I went to see her and I went to thank her. And I said, but why is it already over? Because I wanted more of this. And I was enjoying, I was enjoying yeah. learning the massage as well. So she says, well, well, the next step is a 200 hour uh, Swedish massage technique. And I said, okay, so where do I register for that? So I registered to that and then mm -hmm. 15 hours in, yeah, but Isabel, you need to have, you know, uh, 40 hours of human anatomy. <laughs> okay. So I went to do that and I ended up becoming a massage therapist mm. just by being curious and learning new things and learning things that I was realizing actually interested me. Yeah. And that's how I became a massage therapist, quite by accident, actually. <laughs> I was actually very curious about that turn because that's yeah, not no, it's, a military massage therapist, you know, so it's, it's yeah, a it's uh, fascinating atypical. turn. <laughs> yeah. So while you were yeah. there, because I know the world of massage therapists and um, one having to need to come into their body and start to begin to become familiar with awareness and that type of stuff, energy, all of those different things that one must begin to experience and have knowledge of. As you were um, introducing yourself to this new information, if you will, what did it begin to do to you as an individual 
um, uh, as far as your insight. I tell, I'll, I'll tell people this, uh, Isabel. I, I think passion is the tool by which is deposited into every individual to make them aware of whatever they're doing, if it's theirs or not. If you're in a job and there's no passion, you don't belong there. You're you don't belong there at all. So right. You're, it's 17 million percent, right? Joy. Yeah. Joy yes. is is the tool that tells you if you're on the right path. Yeah. Period. And you're passion is joy. It's another form of joy. Yeah. Yes. Joy mm -hmm. is the key and joy has to be cultivated. Yeah. You know, in, in, in my work, I'm stepping forward a little bit, but I know that I I in my daily work, mm -hmm. the question that I get asked the most often is what do I, when do I know that it's intuition yeah. and not a figment of my imagination? And I always answer the same thing. Joy. Because yeah. when you're on the right path, when you are connected to who you are, and when you're connected to your, your essence and your mission, I hate that word, but I'll use it again. Your mission mm -hmm. or your purpose. I'll use purpose. Yeah. It's better. Purpose. When you're connected to your purpose, you're joyful. Yeah. I and agree. the second thing is intuition is uncomfortable. Yeah. Because intuition, intuition doesn't, doesn't scream. It whispers, mm -hmm. but it whispers constantly. Awesome, yeah. And when you're creating an image in your mind and that image is wonderful and it's, we're back to my Disney movie and we're, we're, it's, it, you know, flutes and trumpets and, and it's <laughs> all great. And it's only like no resistance. That's fabricated. That's not what intuition yeah. feels like. Intuition whispers. And in order to hear intuition, you have to shut up. Yeah. You have to go within and be quiet for a while. But we live in a world where quiet is underrated we, we yeah. no longer we don't no longer do quiet and that's a damn shame because yeah, people are afraid so um here you are we're I never alone <laughs> yeah talk to most of this young girl as she started introducing all of these things because she has to introduce all these new tools within into her being and they are now going to begin to awaken her in, into new areas of life and experience. How did she receive all of this stuff, Isabel? I'm, a, I'm an all or nothing kind of a person. That's, that is my personality. I wish I was mm -hmm. different, but I'm not. <laughs> no, sometimes I wish I was different, but I'm not. And, um, most valuable tools or life lessons that I've received in my life are always served like a two by four across the chest mm -hmm. because I'm an intense person and I'd rather be hit hard and move on than to do it little by little. <laughs> It'd be easier, but hey, I can't go against my nature. Yeah. So it it the fact the fact is it was creeping in on me slowly. Mm -hmm. But for me and the second slap on the face was after, once I'd outlived my mom. Yeah. Once I turned thirty seven, because my mother passed, she was thirty six. So once I turned thirty seven it i i had a breakthrough i really had a breakthrough moment because i was so used to being sad and angry and bitter and 
which at this point I didn't even know why anymore because I had disconnected from the root of everything that every that that I had built on the sadness of losing my mom as a kid and I had a really really violent um aha moment and it was violent it really was and I got up one morning and I looked at myself in the mirror and as I was explaining to you Ken a little earlier before we started recording when we look at ourselves especially women and I hope that's changing but when we look at ourselves in the mirror we don't look at ourselves at ourselves we look for reassurance we look to yeah. see if our hair is okay do i have spinach in my teeth oh man i have a new wrinkle on the side of my eyes or an age spot or anything like that but we don't look at ourselves but that moment i inst instinctively looked in my eyes and i said out loud I was alone in my apartment and I said out loud, I can't live like this anymore. So either, and I was dead serious, either I kill myself today mm -hmm. or I choose another way to live. And I just chose another way to live. So I seeked professional help to go uncover everything that had been hidden deep inside of me to tap into the root of the sadness. And as I dealt with the sadness, the bitterness and the anger and everything else that was derivative, derivative from that mm -hmm. just dissipated because I was dealing with the, the real issue. Yeah. That is, that is a powerful story. I like what you said, you know, that um, most people, not just women, I think we all go to that mirror for reassurance. And I think that's a powerful insight that you have there. Because um, yeah. I've had moments where I would stare into my, my eyes and just look at myself and have a conversation. And I appreciate the fact that you mentioned that you had that conversation with yourself. I tell people all the time, Isabel, the reason why you are living a circular life is because you haven't made a decision as yet. Amen. The human being, the human creature is designed that once it decides and says enough, it will then take the necessary steps in order to make that a reality because they meant exactly what they said. And I tell people, until you find that, you are living a circular life. You will not begin to move forward until you do that. Because when you do that, you will then, be, all of a sudden, the mind, the thought, everything begins to take Align. the steps necessary to make it a reality. And at that point, that individual feels that there's no turning back. I've got to continue. And that's when life, that's when it really starts because you are now beginning on your journey of discovering who you are at that point. And I tell people that's to me is the beginning of enlightenment. That's right there, right there. Enlightenment to me, Isabel, is that we become better students of ourselves. You went and you sought out a, we may call it for our storytelling purpose, we will say that you went and you served as a sage to assist you with um, the questions because they will ask you questions that is going to cause you now to begin to become um, introspective to find out the reasons behind your actions. So when you began that conversation and you began to um, enter into the reasonings behind, what did you discover that was residing within the uh, layers in that dungeon, as they say, 
what were some of those skeletons that you began to uncover as you began to look deeper? Oh, so many things. Uh, well, the first thing that that um, that was discovered in this journey for me was that I had blocked out sixteen months of my life. So the first the the first sixteen months after my mom passed. So, mm. um, so I uncovered that nothing, um, nothing surprising in the fact that I had blocked it, and nothing surprising in what I discovered from after that, um, yeah. from that period. But that was the first thing. And uh, as time went on, and I worked with several different coaches and therapists and ser with different techniques. I really, mm -hmm. I really don't believe in going to see the same coach or therapist for 30 years every week. I really don't, but that's my, mm -hmm. my personal take on it is change, change perspective, yeah. change technique, change person, change, because that's how you get higher. Yes. But every step, when you climb a ladder, there isn't one uh, bar that's uh, more important than the others. They're all yeah. important. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, that was really the first thing. The second thing is I discovered just how strong I really am. Mm. And that I don't have a conventional way of looking at life. It's a good thing, I think. Yeah. So actually, at, not at the end, because I'm not done. I'm not sitting on top of Everest waiting for everybody else to climb. I'm climbing with yeah. everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I will never stop climbing because I will never reach the top. Uh, yeah. And thank goodness for that. But... Yeah. I realized along the way that I no longer need to be understood. Yeah. That being understood is a way that humans have to feel connected to others. And I can connect with you. And even if you don't understand me, that doesn't matter. Yeah. That you don't understand my journey, it doesn't matter because it's not your journey. Mm -hmm. What I wish for is that you respect that our journeys are different. But yes. that you understand it? Nah. It's And the best teacher of that for me was the relationship that I have with my best friend. We have been friends since... 1989, and Josie and I have absolutely nothing in common. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. She's married. I'm not. She has kids. I don't. She. We have nothing in common except for our friendship. Yeah. And there is extraordinary value in that. Because if I bounce an idea of her or if I share something that's happened to me with her or anything at all, her perspective will always be different and therefore yeah. will always increase mine. Yeah, that's powerful. Oh, oh. She, and it's, it goes both ways because we speak to one another with respect. And what we mm -hmm. say to one another comes from love. Yeah. So that's the perspective deep. is yeah. always different. And that's a strength. Yeah. That's a big, big strength. Yeah. I have an analogy about that type of relationship. And I think it's for everyone. I think we all come to this planet with a... As as artists, you know, I'm, I'm a musician and I see this plain white canvas. And you, uh, Isabel, you're painting your picture and you're using colors and I'm doing the same. I'm using colors. And I look over to yours and yours is 
the colors, the usage of your color is very different than how mine is. And you use blue or green differently than mine. And I'm looking at yours going, wow, that's, that's interesting. So I, I would have a conversation with you. Tell me about why do you use green like this? What, what is it do you see? And you will now introduce me to a new perspective that I have been painting my, my, you know, my blue and I, I'm, I'm good with it. But I'm looking over and I see that you're mixing in green differently and I have this conversation with you. And so you are now going to introduce a new perspective into my life. Now, what I do with that a new perspective, that new information, can it help me to adjust my painting or I could just move on? You know, but I shouldn't be looking at yours and criticizing the way that you use your green. I, what gives me the right to do that? I, it doesn't make any sense to me that we are both artists creating and your critic. It doesn't make any sense. But yet we do this on a daily basis with others. And so to me, it's a sad thing that you're criticizing another artist of their work when you should really appreciate and be inquisitive about it so that you can learn and be a better artist, if you will, um, by incorporating all the different techniques and colors into your into your uh, lifestyle and so forth. So that's my belief on that, Isabel. I really believe that that's how we should look at it. I think it'll be easier than to be such um, animals to each other for lack of a better word but i i'm straightforward people will tell you i, I just call it like i see it so um it's so ego fed though yes it it's, is it's it ego is. fed yeah it's the need to be right yeah um and i think we'll, we'll get into the, the other conversation that i think is going to lead us to with that particular part about ego so here we are you're introducing all of these different <clears throat> tools. Talk to me about some of the tools that you brought into your space to help you through all of these painful um, states that your emotions had you. What were some of those tools that you introduced into your life is about to help you to manage all of those things? Well, the first one is joy because I realized that I didn't have a source of joy in my life at all. So I started singing. I I come from a musical family, so I started singing again. I start I I sang for a classical music choir for a decade, a little over a decade. Mm -hmm. And then I started dancing. But mm -hmm. it, that's linked to music and that's linked to joy. So for me the biggest, biggest tool is music linked. Yeah. There's a connection to music. Um and all I'm I'm not a musical snob. I all listen to jazz and I'll listen to hip hop and I like Eminem and and yeah. well some of his lyrics is, is too negative for my mind but uh but I still like him. I, I really do yeah. and I'll listen to Mozart and I'll listen to ABBA and and ZZ Top, right? So, oh yeah, I, music. I, I like them all. Yeah, yeah, music is is for me is the best way, and I'm, and and there's science behind that. I mean, the the mm -hmm. brain doesn't process music the same way; it processes everything else. So, music is the biggest, and the second one, um, and it's an important one too that I that I also. Um, teach when working with clients is whenever you're overwhelmed or whenever you're in a situation, stick with the facts. Yeah. So if you start any sentence that I, I feel, or this made me feel, or I think, or anything that's, that is all emotion driven and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Emotions are very important. It's okay to acknowledge them. It's actually very important to acknowledge them. But the tool for me not to get overwhelmed by anything is yeah. asking myself, what do I know right now about this situation? What do I know? So I know that I'll give you an example because it'll be easier. 
I, um, I'm at that age where we get mammograms and I went for a mammogram on the Thursday and on, on the Monday morning, the secretary of the lab calls me and says, Dr. X wants another mammogram. So I did not allow my mind to wander and think, oh my goodness, I have breast cancer. I'm going to die. I'm not <laughs> done this. I'm, I did not give myself permission to go through that. I yeah. said to myself, what do I know now? I know that I did a mammogram and I know that I need another mammogram. Mm -hmm. These are the only two things that I know. And when you don't allow yourself to start writing a movie or a drama series with the facts, <laughs> then you don't become overwhelmed. Well, Ken, I went for, <clears throat> excuse me, I went for the second mammogram. Turns out that the first image was just not of good quality. And that's mm -hmm. why they needed another one. And they took another one. And within five minutes, the doctor came to see me and she said, yeah, it's okay. Thanks. We'll see you in two years. So yeah. had I written the drama series on the fact that I needed a second mammogram and I would have spoken to my dad and worried him with that and spoken to my sister and worried her with that and spoke to my best friend and worried her with that. And now everybody's worried about the fact that I need a second mammogram. All of that energy is crap. Yeah. It's crap. And it's feeding my desire and my need to be supported and to feel important. Because, of course, if if there's something wrong with me, all of these people are going to want to support me. Of course, because yeah. they love me. And thank goodness for that. But at this particular moment, I didn't need support. I needed to be patient. Yeah. And the best way for me to do that is to stick to what I know. What are the facts? Control, control your we thoughts. Live, exactly. And, but we live in a, in a society where people confuse their emotions with facts. Yeah. When you don't and do that. The, uh, yeah. Go ahead. The, uh, the, the, the fear-based thinking, and you're a mindset coach, and you know that one of the most powerful and destructive um, state that a human being can put himself in is that of fearfulness. Um, when you get there, like you said, you become a uh, soap opera and your imagination is a great writer um, and will write you some of the best scripts that you'll ever have in a couple of seconds and uh, um, finish and, and, you know, ready to get your Oscar. But if you learn to um, not give it permission, and that is the key I, I, I try to explain. It is you who give the thought permission. So you have to take back ownership of the thought. They come, they come freely, and then that's fine. Um, but you do not have to agree with it. Once you agree with it, you then had given that thought permission to reside within your being, within your imagination, to bring forth fruit. And it will bring forth fruit because that's what it does. And so uh, be very mindful as you, you, you know, what type of thought that you give because it activates your emotion. Fearfulness, <laughs> that, that thing, once it grabs you, Man, like you said, you got to call your sister, your grandmother, the dog, and everybody and tell them, hey, I'm, I'm down, man. Um, and I'm probably going to be gone by Friday. And you, you, you didn't <laughs> know anything yet, you know. So yeah, exactly. that's what it does. And so mm -hmm. unless you become um, the one that controls that, become uh, the owner, the, the, a warrior, guard your, uh, a guard of your thoughts, you, you've lost. The battle is always there. 
the manifestation of whatever else shows up because you've lost the battle, <laughs> you know? And so here you are, and you are this woman learning about this thing. You had this wonderful encounter with yourself, staring in the mirror. You made your declaration that begins to guide you and move you through life. You're now becoming a um, not a default liver. You're becoming a purposeful designer of your life, if you will, by, as we were talking about, what thoughts you let in. Um, as you are incorporating tools, you mentioned a couple of them. What other tools did you bring in? Because you had mentioned earlier that you uh, like to bring in different other folks around that uh, house other information that will assist you to grow. Your friend is, is uh, your go-to person. I have a friend like that, um, that, so I know how special that is. So how, uh, what are the tools that you started bringing in to your space, um, Isabel? Silence. Silence, nature, exercise. Um, that kind of all showed up at the same time in my life. Yeah. Um, Powerful I was stuff, always, though. yeah, I was always afraid of the dark and afraid of silence because you're stuck with yourself. Yeah. So, but now it's uh, quite the opposite, actually. I cherish silence and, and I'll, I'll go for walks for miles and miles and, not bring my phone and not bring an iPod and not listening to a yeah. podcast. Sorry, Ken. Uh, not <laughs> just me. Well, I have a, I, I, I'm a dog mama, so bring the dog, but an even connection to the dog too, because they, animals live in that present. There's so much lesson yeah. to learn from that. Yeah. It's, it's here and now. He doesn't know tomorrow exists. Yeah, so, you and I had talked. Um, we had talked earlier about this thing about the situation that you're in currently, and how you are being um, stretched um, with your family member. How you're being stretched, and you are <laughs> where an old friend, if you will, is waiting to stick its heads out that anger to cause you to be uh, to step into something how do you because this is you have to learn how to live present right there how did you bring into your presentness if you will and not allow that old friend to show up and cause a lot of um drama and trauma in in, in the family i think that by recognizing that it's there yeah. I think that's the first thing is I work every day on my self awareness and I and I question myself because see earlier you were mentioning that like in therapy and and even with with coaches you know they they ask you questions and that that's how you get to reflect on what you're going through and that's how you draw conclusions. Mhm. Mm but I find that the answers don't reside in the answers. I'm going to explain yeah. this one. Yeah. I think that the answers is in the question. It's in mm -hmm. asking the right question. Because if you want to learn something about yourself, you have to ask questions until you don't know the answer. Because yeah. if you already know the answer, then you're not learning something new. You're just reaffirming what you what you already know, and that's okay too. I mean, sometimes we need that. Yeah. But when you want to learn something, you have to be willing to go where you haven't gone before. So when I feel the anger, like I have a situation with somebody in my life right now, and yes, the anger is is popping its head, saying hello. I'm here, <laughs> and I'm. It's it's like at the fair, you know, when you're trying to tap yeah. the, the 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 ball. It's it's. I'm not tapping on the ball. I'm letting it rise, and I look at it, and I say, okay, so 
Why are you here? Why is this situation making me angry? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to ask, I haven't, I don't have the answer as of yet, but I'm going to ask why until there is no answer. Because yeah. that's where I'm going to learn something about myself. So there's a, it, it, the, the, the five whys. Have you ever heard this, this, um, this exercise? It's called the five whys. It's an engineering exercise. Mm-hmm. Is if they have a problem, they'll say, okay, so what's the problem? Why do we have the problem? Okay, because this. Okay, so why? And, and they go back and usually by the, fourth or fifth why they understand the root of the problem they fix it and Mm -hmm. there you go when i do these exercises with my clients i say it's not five it's until there is no answer you ask why until you can't find the answer and sometimes it'll take three and sometimes it'll take 15 but you ask why until but you have you can't ignore it this the the anger is rising up in me in regards to the situation. Okay, so why? Yeah. But you have to be willing to look at the answer. Yeah, I I had a similar situation, and I remember this was a few weeks ago, and um, I was riding on my bike early in the morning and um, heading to some place, and the thought came, "Why are you taking it personal?" And I remember, you know, allowing the thought to really uh, come in and to begin to investigate it. And I said to myself, yeah, why are you taking this person? And as I began to ask those questions, and you are correct, the answers are in the questions. That's why I tell people, make sure when you're trying to find a coach, find one has been through some stuff. Someone got... Some someone who's been damaged a little, because they know the question to ask that will bring the result. They are ready to see it. They know what to ask because they've been exactly where you are, but they know how to frame that question to get the results that you don't know that you know that you know, but they know that you know that you know. And so I was there on this this morning and and. Um, as I began to delve into that question, Isabella, it, 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 um, I realized that every single time I ever got hurt was because I allowed something to come into my space and I took it personally. And I remember starting to dance with that thought for a minute. Wow. If I allow anything into my space where it becomes personal, expectations, all of the other things that I allow to come in and cause it to become personal because of expectations. This is one of the first things. And I realized that, wait a minute, I'm in control of me. They are in control of them. I cannot, and I choose not to allow what they're doing to come into my space to cause me to take it personal. And when I said that, I realized, oh my God, I need to learn how to live in the present. <laughs> that is the only way that and you can do And it's a that. constant, it's a constant lesson. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a client tough of one. mine, a client of mine recently said she was a little bit discouraged and she was having a rough moment and she says, but one when am I going to be able to do this without your help? And I said, well, you already can. I'm talking myself out of a job, but she she mm-hmm. uh, already can. And she says, I can? She says, yeah. Yeah. You just have to learn how to ask the right questions. Yeah. That's that's it. And you you, you have to be willing to not find the answers. Yeah. That's the tough stuff, isn't it? Because so, it's not about the que- it's not about the answers, it's about the question. It's the question. And um a lot of them when that light bulb comes on, 
uh, when they get it, it's really fascinating to see. So here you are, you're a massage therapist. We didn't go into mindset coaching yet. <laughs> no, we, we, we that didn't took even talk decade. about how. <laughs> <laughs> that took another decade. I'm, about... a, I'm a I'm yeah. a slow learner, Ken. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Thank God for that. So, <laughs> how did you start to migrate towards the mindset um, coaching, and also because you became a speaker as well? How did all of that begin to manifest? in your life? Okay, so that's actually two answers. The public speaking, the teaching, the, the, the I, I, I was like that in grade school. You know, mm. in grade school, when we had to first, for the first time, go in front of the class and talk about something for five minutes, I was always the first one up and the one that spoke <laughs> the longest. Yeah. Um, even in the military, I, I, I taught uh, recruit school for a little while. Um, so the, the teaching, the being in front, the being the communicator, was that's, that was in me. So yeah. as far as becoming a mindset coach, it's, mm -hmm. it was, again, an accident because I follow uh, I follow where life leads me. So it was a client. Yeah. She had been coming to see me as a massage therapist for a few years, actually quite some years. And at the end of an appointment, she was paying and taking her next appointment. And she just said, you know, Isabel, I don't come to see you for the massages. I come to see you to talk to you. And every time I <laughs> leave your house, I always, whatever I am going through, whether at work or with her kids or with her husband, I always leave your house with a new perspective on whatever problem I'm facing. You're like my life coach, she says. <laughs> and I kind of looked at her and I know I'm different and I know I have a very singular way of looking at life and looking at things. So I started going to school again. I'll, I'll <laughs> be in school. I'll be the 83-year-old that's full-time in university. Yeah. Uh, so I went back to school again, and I enjoyed every single minute of it. And I did some EFT and some, some NPL and some, yeah. And I NLP eventually, and, and I, and I kept on being a massage therapist. I, I mm -hmm. retired uh, from massage therapy <laughs> in, in 2022, and I have been a mindset coach mm -hmm. since 2009. So it, but for me, it was two things that were very, very parallel and very, very, but, you know, I wouldn't do both at the same time, but they were, yeah. were two career at the same time. Yeah. And then, well, 2022, well, for, you know, COVID changed a few things. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, after 23 years of being a massage therapist, my body was tired. So yeah. it was time for me to, to stop. Yeah, you guys mess around with people's energy all day long for hours and hours and hours. And it does yeah. have an effect on your body if you're yeah. not. Um, and again, that's uh, living in the awareness. You have to be in the awareness to have your form or you can be damaged and hurt and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you guys, I take take my hat off to you because of understanding of um, what you're doing with uh, energy and uh, bringing uh, some relief from the trauma that people have in their bodies. Mm -hmm. So here you are. You are now uh, a mindset. I love how you, you, you do your thing. And when you make your decision, you just move forward and gain the additional information that is necessary to cause you to become proficient in what you do. Uh, that is the key, guys. Just keep moving. I always tell people, they will, someone will say to me, I'm stuck. I'm like, no, yep. no. <laughs> keep moving. Um, no such thing. Just find a way. Yeah, just uh, if you're dead, that's it. So here you <laughs> are, you are not. <laughs> yeah, death, you're, you're stuck for a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it's it's just the body is is yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, surrender yeah. the body. 
<laughs> but you're still moving. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, you're still moving. You just surrendered the body. So here you are now. You are the mindset coach, and um, somehow you've decided to begin to uh, put this information into a format by which we call these things books. What was the catalyst that started you down that road and how did it come about? Oh, that's a good question. So first of all, there is, um, I'm very, very dyslexic. So for me, reading is very difficult. I mm -hmm. uh, read to learn things. And then Audible arrived. And now I can yeah. consume books like there's no tomorrow because there's somebody's going to read it for me. So there are two things that happens in regards to my book. The first one is a long time ago. There was a um, French uh, writer here in Quebec where I live that had said in an interview um, that if you don't like to read, you should never write a book. So for me, I mm. bought that as the, as the God's given truth. And I don't know why I did that because I don't know this man, but I, yeah. I decided that he was right. So mm. I had been toying because people kept on telling me we're back to somebody else, you know, just pitching ideas. But people have been, had been telling me, you should write your memoirs. You should write what your story. And so I had. I thought for sure I couldn't because I don't read. So, yeah. And then about three decades later, I saw an interview. I think it was a podcast actually with Brene Brown and Simon Sinek. And Simon had written at this point, uh, had written three books. Mm -hmm. And he said to Brene Brown, if it wasn't for the three books that I wrote, I wouldn't have, I would have never read a book. <laughs> so he just, here's this guy who is known worldwide and, <laughs> yeah. and he destroyed my limiting beliefs that had been <laughs> triggered by somebody else. Yeah. And I went, mm -hmm. okay, so well, if Simon Sinek can write a book and he doesn't read, <laughs> so why couldn't I write a book? <laughs> so, and I had had, this this image in my mind for a long time, because for a long, long time, my catchphrase was mind your own business. But I wouldn't even say that as um, shoving people aside. Mm. It was it was quite actually quite inclusive in the sense that it goes back to what you were saying earlier about you riding your bike and asking yourself, why am I taking this personally? So mm -hmm. for me, mind your own business means that. Mm -hmm. If my nephew, I, I'm saying and none of what I'm going to say is true, but if my nephew came to my house and told me he was gay, why is this any of my concern? Is yeah. he is he destroying my livelihood? No, is he and even if he was going against my values, these are my values, not his. He doesn't have yeah. to live mm -hmm. his life by my values. So yeah. yeah. So that's what it means to me, mind your own business. But I thought if I called my book Mind Your Own Business, maybe people wouldn't um <laughs> read it and maybe would people wouldn't understand what i mean yeah. so i i i on the book cover it's actually the the word business is written and i crossed it out and then underneath mm. i wrote in big red letters happiness mind your own happiness because nobody's responsible for making you happy but you so mind yeah. your own happiness that's that's my upcoming book don't know when it's going to be available but i will keep you posted <laughs> I I'm, love the I'm title, by the way. Thank you. I'm shooting for September. Let's hope that I'll I'll be okay. <laughs> awesome. We'll we'll um, help you out with that. Um, Thank you, all you guys that have been listening to us. This has been a fabulous 
uh, conversation. And I really didn't want to end it because we, we were learning so much. And um, uh, we are, uh, I'll tell you what, guys, I'm going to try and see if I could uh, corral her back when she brings her book so that the we can continue yes. our conversation. So um, uh, all of you that have been listening to this, I have someone that as far as in mind and understanding the thoughts, I have someone that can guide you. Someone that understands the purpose of the questions that can open you up and introduce you to you and i cannot wait when we post this we're going to have all of her stuff so that you guys can have access to her run to her uh, get into her space so that you can become you can look your eye look yourself in that mirror and say "Uh uh-uh this is a new day i got somebody who can help you to stand before that mirror and walk with you And uh, Isabel, I want to thank you for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you for having me. It's just, I I didn't even see the time fly by. You can, uh, (laughs) you can invite me anytime you want. I think this is our first, but far from being our last conversation. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Welcome.